Good evening, dear colleagues and guests. I'm delighted to welcome you today to the lecture by Josefina von Sitzewitz. First, allow me to introduce our speaker today. Currently, Josie is Marie Sklodowska Kurie Research Fellow at the Arctic University of Norway in Tromsø. Um, the Marie Sklodowska Curie actions are part of the European program Horizon 2020. Before that, Josie had various positions as lecturer and research fellow at the universities of Oxford, Cambridge, and Bristol. Josie received her PhD in Russian literature from the University of Oxford, the St. John's College in 2010. She's author of two monographs. In 2016, she published a book on poetry and the Leningrad Religious Philosophical Seminar in the 1976 until 1980, Music of a Deep Age. This book deals with such famous poets as Viktor Krivulin, Jelena Schwarz, or also Sergei Stratanovsky, Alek Akhapkin, and Alexander Mironov. The book was awarded the Ansiferov Prize in St. Petersburg, the category Best Work on St. Petersburg by a foreign author. And most recently, she published a new book about the Samistad, the production and circulation of texts outside of official channels in the Soviet Union. The book deals with different actors involved in Samistad, readers, typists, librarians, and the editors of periodicals in the 1970s Leningrad and analyzes their communities, networks, and cultures. Um, our colleague Ilya Kukulin from Moscow writes about her book. I quote, based on numerous interviews and memoirs and focusing on the various people and institutions which were charged with difficult task of disseminating Samistad, this is the first monograph to vividly describe and analyze Samistad as a complex and integral part of Soviet life. As such, the culture of Samizdat is absolutely indispensable for all scholars of late Soviet society, end of quote. The title of the monograph is The Culture of Samizdat's Literature and Underground Networks in the Late Soviet Union, and it is published this year by Bloomsbury. Josie has also translated a large number of poems, including texts by famous poets such as Arseny Tarkovsky, Bulat Akujava, Irina Mashinsky, and Andrea Eisenberg, but also by young poets like the Uzbek author Alina Dadaeva or Ksenia Zeludova. She's currently working with Hila Cohen on a special issue of the online magazine for international literature, Words Without Borders. The issue deals with poetry translations of the young Wasophonia and is forthcoming in spring. She has also received several awards for her poetry translations. Today, Josie speaks about a very topical and political charged issue. The title is Case Study Galina Rimbu, Maya Vagina, June 2020. The lecture will be published in a volume of our International Journal for Comparative Cultural Studies dealing with poetry, politics, and media, which will appear in the summer, in uh, next summer. Um, we now look forward to your presentation, Josie, and I give you the floor. Thank you so much, Henrika, for the um, very generous edu um, intro introduction. If I ever need a publicity officer, um, I know where to turn to. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll um, speak English I, um, much quicker when I speak English on academic issues. And um, I can see um, Ella Mingazma here, and um, I think these two talks actually fit together really neatly, um, because I'm also going to talk about a, um, a social media phenomenon that looks very, very different from what um, you described. And yet some of the mechanisms really are the same. So um, internet as a prelude to print and so on. So I'm going to share my screen which probably means that I can't see you anymore. So please send me an email or something if I disappear. Um, and I'll end the slideshow if I can. This computer is very slow. All right. 
um, that should do it. Um, so Galina Rimbu, whom you probably will know as a prominent feminist poem, um, published in June of this year, this horrible year, she published a poem called Maya Vagina on her Facebook feed, and that became one of the literary sensations of the year. So um, you can see here, I mean, these are just some of, these are from some of the things that have um, happened. So it was actually um, written for a, um, in solidarity, solidarity um, with um, Julia Skipkova, who is facing charges of um, distributing pornography. Um, she published it on Facebook. It went absolutely viral, caused a lot of discussion Actually, most of it not on Galina's own Facebook page, but on pages of other people who had shared the um, who had shared the the, the poem. Um, and um, so, what then happened? Um, I can show you some examples. So, you don't need to read these texts, um, especially not the one on the left. Um, these are just examples. Other poets, um, quite a few of them, I can provide a list if wanted. Um, wrote poems in support, and the um, picture you see on the right is a, is Photoshop. Um, and there are several of these, and um, some of them in Russian, some of them in English. Um, so photoshopped onto buildings. So this was um, done by a public art group, um, and um, several cult uh, cultural institutions in Russia released statements in the def in defense of Rumble because um, actually for some of the longer unpleasant discussions and blog posts you have to go outside Facebook but if you just google in Russian you will find lots of um, examples so it is a solidarity poem written in support of the artist and LGBT activist you let speak Koba and these are um, just to give you a, an impression, these are some of the images for which she is facing a charge of distributing pornography. Um, so abstract paintings of vaginas for a, a group on Vkontakte, which is called Vagina Monologues. And so also for her body positivity campaign, here are some examples um, under the title Rejshine Nekupuli. So, um, and Russia has a funny um, legal situation which might be useful to know. You are allowed to consume pornography, but you are not allowed to produce and circulate it. And um, there is no very no clear dis uh, definition. However, I tend to think that if these things um, if these things excite you sexually, then maybe you should um, have yourself looked at. Anyway, so loads of artists produced material in solidarity of Tsvetkova, and on twenty seventh of June this year, um, a concerted campaign began, which is called Media Strike. And that is what um, Urumbo wrote her um, poem for, curated by the Vasnysinski uh, Center um, in Moscow. So that runs to over nine hours. This is Urumbo's poem. And no, I haven't made a very bad slide. And you now have to work with this text. I'm just giving you this text. This, this is eight point font. Um, to give you an impression of how long it is and how strange it is if you read this thing on Facebook because you have to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll, especially if you're using a mobile phone. And um, so this is this is the um, this is the um, poem, and it seems that the scandal it caused um, has made a significant contribution towards communicating the link between feminist poetry and feminist activism to people outside of literary activist or critical circles. Um, because Rimbaud is also active in various feminist projects and um, collaborating with other feminists who are doing projects. So this poem employs a form that has become increasingly common in Rimbaud's poetry, so it's very long. And it consists of these separate sections, and you can see them on the screen. You can see them, they are separated um, by little stars, so it's totally separate sections. 
that pursue their own, each section pursue this own focus. Written in free verse, um, the language is simple, the metaphors are transparent, and the phrasing is very concise. So it's very accessible. It's topical and it's very accessible and it's supremely translatable. And these factors have all aided its proliferation. The apparent simplicity, though, of this poem is offset by its composition. If you read this, if you read this attentively, you will see that it is laced with references to the Tvitkova warfare, where both Tvitkova's name and her public contracts are mentioned. Um, then we have gender, the, the topics of gender fluidity and of homosexual sex between women, um, because um, Tvitkova is is active in the in the, um, in the um, LGBT scene. And it is also Maya Vagina, I think part of why why is it so um, it has been used as a as a textbook poem for feminism now is because it's almost archetypical in how it displays feminist tenets. And yet at the same time, it is strikingly original and personal. So let's have a look at um, so, um, words of the translation, this is not Kevin Fatt's translation, these are my own word-for-word -word trots to make it easier um, if somebody is not so quick with Russian. Um, so this is, um, so here the vagina, this is section five, becomes a stand-in for the female body as a whole when the poet offers this rather weary observation that in Russian society, a science society struggling with patriarchal heritage, everybody, um, my vagina is everyone's business. So this is um, a list which I think um, becomes very um, impressive if you if you read it aloud. Um, another feature that betrays her ties the the, the, the the context in which this poem was written as contemporary Russian feminism is the manner in which merges and even identifies the private with the political. Um, and this is one of the things that she keeps repeating that the private is political, so this is really um, outspokenly important for her. And she actually says, I like, me and Ravitsa, my city, you are the Maya Vagina politicheski. So I like, about, I like to think about it in political terms. And um, so the private, in its most basic definition, in her imagery becomes the most the strongest political force that could possibly be so she her language is, is interesting it's really devoid of irony um or at least not an irony that is visible from the from just looking at the text so she declares that it's the vagina that will achieve the feats that many political activists not just feminists dream of может и правда вагина погубит это государство, прогонит незаконного президента, отправится в ставку правительства. And by the end of the poem, and particular once we have read the companion poem, Vilika Ruska Literatura, which I will be talking about in a bit more detail, um, we are inclined to agree that this is possible. And then now, after that, what happened with the protests in Belarus, led by women and, of course, in Poland, where an anti, a proposed anti-abortion law has um, mobilized not just women, but also men. And it has turned into protests against the authoritarian politics of the ruling party, rather than just, just um, a protest against an issue affecting women. How does Rimbo achieve this? So the separate section of the poem really hone in on the great taboos that still surround the female body and i think this is where we can find the reason for many of the um, um really annoyed responses to it 
um, and they are certainly not limited to Russia. So section one begins with the physicality of childbirth. So the definite womanly act, men can't have babies. And so, and it's also really important because this is what women are measured against. Are you a mother? Do you have children? Um, and of course, reproduction in, is critical to the species. But what we normally omit from glossy pictures of new motherhood is the physical damage that can actually happen to um, a woman when she gives birth. Потом мою войну зашли, ли они она изменила форму, стала узкой и стянутой вагина керма вагина рана. Second section. Um, very, very different, very different in tone, maybe the most beautiful section of all of them. It's an erotic poem and um, it tells of the joy of sexual union in woman-centric images, so in feminist images. Теперь моя вагина – это норка для твоего коричневого зверка с большой красной головкой. Да, он иногда проскальзывает, чтобы набраться сил. So it is the woman that gives strength to the man through her body. These images are particular to the couple portrayed. So even the expressions that she uses in this video is probably personal. Um, so it places them beyond the norms that define sex in the public eye, norms that are shaped by pornography, real pornography, and obscene language. Actually, just by the by, if we identify Rumbu with the first person narrator, um, then she has, at this point, after section two of the poem, shown to be a perfectly traditional woman. She is a mother, and she is a woman who likes heterosexual sex the way it's supposed to be done. Quote. Um, Good, so let's move on from there. Section four, um, I don't have a quote from there. Um, Rimbo celebrates menstruation as a special time to be enjoyed. And for her, it's a prime occasion for having sex. And she has, a, the, 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 the speaker of the poem has an enlightened male partner who, um, who celebrates her body and her natural function. So, and of course, this is a taboo because many religious traditions have um, continued to regard menstruating women as ritually impure. And this has trickled through into culture. So in Judaism and Islam, um, women are ritually impure. In Hinduism, they are. Um, and so this has been used to limit women's action at access to public space. Um, I skip over a couple of things because otherwise I will never get through. Um, although this quotation might be interesting. So this is her exploration of sex. Um, so she tried to masturbate with the help of a, of a cucumber and didn't get very far. But they shouldn't know that it's not just penetration. So sex is not just penetration. Perhaps an experience that is true to many women. Um, she also then she um, goes on to explore the excitement of touch with a female school friend. So, of course, including a lesbian seen as token of explicit solidarity with LGBT activists, such as Svitkova. Um, and it protects this poem. Um, against being interpreted as heteronormative because so far this has been this has been um, all about heterosexual um, action. So well, perhaps the scene of two girls sharing physical bliss and speechlessness acknowledges that sexuality is a spectrum and people might find themselves on different points over the course of their lives. Um, something that has Enraged critics is Rimbaud's terminology, and her terminology is very precise and very neutral and very, in a sense, medical, precise and unemotive. So, vagina, clitor, penetratia, 
член, промежность, месячные. Um, so her language, um, vagina, clitoris, penetration, perineum, uh, menstruation, period, um, is really a contrast to the euphemisms we tend to use um, for body parts and physiological processes and to obscene language, which so often centers on sex. Um, and um, she, the second quotation on this slide, Rimbo inverts received discourse. So she makes it her own when she observes that while women allegedly have a posse, and you will remain, I mean, he's skirt, and you will remember Donald Trump saying, grab women by the posse. Um, Hers is nothing like it. It is the exact opposite of a kiska of a pussy of a cat. It's a pretty skittish mouse. Наша вагина вульвы называют кисками, у меня скорее не киска, домашняя декоративная мышка маленькая, пушистая и спокойная. And then she goes on um, talking about about her most terms. Um, the final section consists of a chain of images that explicitly identify the poet with her vagina. My vagina is a любовь, история, политика. My политика – это тело быть, быть аффект. Мой мир – вагина. Я несу мир для некоторых, для некоторых я опасная вагина, боевая вагина. Это мой монолог. So there you have the vagina monologues. Um, so very clever move, actually, an unobtrusive reference to Svetkova's um, group on Vkontakte, the one that earned her the pornography charge. And um, funnily enough, the vagina monologues, um, Eve Ensler's world -firm famous play, um, is um, is being being played in, in Russia, so it's being staged in Russia. As predicted, hang on, no. As predicted in the um, poem, everybody did indeed have something to say about Ringo's vagina. The world of Russian poetry remains largely conservative with regard to both form and content. So this kind of free verse is considerably less common in Russian than it is in English. And also the tradition of confessional poetry is less developed. And then of course, Russian society remains socially conservative. A sizable part of the public um, lends at least silent support to laws such as the gay propaganda law, the law that prescribes the protection of children from information advocating for a denial of traditional family values. So that is the law that is being, can be used against people seen to be representing homosexuality as something that is normal. So Rimbaud's poem is much more daring in its native context than it might sound in English or another Western European language. Many followers and fellow poets expressed support and um, praising both the way the poem is built, so its literary quality, or and Rimbaud's courage in publishing it. Of course, as you can expect, a text like this incites hate speech and some of it was expressed on Rimbaud's own page and uh, made her disable the common function for non-friends, um, which is still off. Um, but uh, most of the derogatory or threatening or just vulgar comments were posted on other people's pages. Without wanting to belittle the abuse it is almost comical to see how a certain segment of the internet reiterates the same tired cliches. That was actually my first reaction. It was not, oh God, this is horrible, um, but it is, oh God, not again. Um, the toxicity of many comments that get very personal or very threatening is unfortunately characteristic of contemporary um, political debates and of the online experience of many people and especially outspoken women and i won't even show you toxic remarks here so i will exclude focus exclusively on two actually discussions that have discernible literary components and that expose that chasm between the literary world of Rimbu and her supporters from that of some of her detractors what so 
special about that, that's healthy, isn't it? Because um, literary, literature is supposed to generate um, debate and um, literary critics would be out of a job if there was nothing to debate. Um, but the problem is that Bimbo's detractors are not talking as literary critics. So they don't talk about this as a text and what may be good about it or bad about it as a text. And um, neither do they have the courage that to say quite simply that they don't like this poem. I don't like free verse. I don't like um, text that has a lot of physical detail. No, they present themselves as guardians of literary morals. So rather than asking questions, engaging in dialogue, um, which requires a baseline of curiosity, um, they tell a fellow poet what to write and what not to write about and how to write. And perhaps surprisingly, the target is a young woman who writes rather unashamedly about sex and about her own sex. Um, and it's at this point that poetry becomes political um, where the goals of Rimbaud's poetry and literature and her feminist activism converge. So she is actually taking aim at the patriarchy. Feminism is at this point no longer about equality or equality before the law. It is about systemic, um, systemic injustice. It is about a, a system based on a hierarchy and a hierarchy that is actually based on strength. The strong is more important than the weak and the male is more important than the female. It's a system that's belligerent, that is normative, that represses what doesn't fit. And you can see that in its violent hatred against male homosexuals who don't behave like men. Um, so this is, I'm just giving you this, this is from, from Rimbu's um, own um, um, preface to the bilingual anthology F Letter that's just been published. So um, she says, Yannick, and she's, she's, Annie, this is, люди выросшие при Путине, для них секс и отношения тесно связаны с насилием, подавлением, унижением, которое рассматривается как возможность доказать свой привилегированный мужской статус за счет более слабых женщин. Um, так стирается различие между милитаризмом и сексуальностью, между близостью и насилием. So, um, basically, um, relationships and relations are dominated by violence, and so violence and sex and militarism and sex become conflated. These are quite stark theses. So Rimbu has become I don't know, consistently, gradually um, uh, starker, stronger in the way she expresses her positions. Let's go to literary criticism. Um, and I, but the reason that I haven't given you English translations is that they don't really fit very well on the screen. So this is, um, everybody bashes him, and I don't want to bash him in particular, but um, he has not, um, he has not, Remove the post, so I think he is happy um, for it to be discussed. So this is a Facebook post from 3rd of July by the Kazakh Russian poet Bakhud Kimjir, who is friends with Rimbo, including on Facebook. And um, this is a perfectly polite, and at the same time, unbearably, unbe this is my personal opinion, unbearably patronizing um, comment, and he had tagged her in it. And so it, it was reflected on her, on her page. And um, so she started a discussion with him and then pulled the discussion across to her page because she said she felt unsafe in the company of the people that were active on his Facebook wall. He didn't censor the um, comments. So he starts with this jovial anecdote um, about the student um, who talks about the organ of love. And um, the professor says, well, um, you won't get a, an A for that because um, in my time, the organ of love was the heart. Это я к тому, что прекрасный и переплакал сегодня в Иисусе. Я длинное стихотворение хорошего поэта Галины Римбу. So Kim Jiev calls her a good poet. 
Оно провагино. И стоило мне увидеть это слово, как сразу потянуло хлорку и формалину, как бы снять детскую. А уж когда дошло до пенетрации, так и подташнивать начало. Ох, не стоит верять альгеброй гармонии, мне кажется. Справедливость. И стихов про поджелудочную железу или 12-перстную кишку тоже, наверное, писать не стоит. So, um, writing about vagina and using words like penetration um, is smells of the morgue. Um, you should not um, you should not verify how many they have with al algebra. And you, why are you writing about this? You wouldn't write about the pancreas or um, the appendix either. If we're supposed to take this seriously, then this revulsion at the medical whiff, which apparently emanates from Primo's choice words, shows an astonishing degree of ignorance, especially if we bear in mind that Kinjir um, has been living in North America since the early 1980s. So he should be more used to or inured to this kind of discourse. Um, the pancreas and appendix are not gender specific, uh, gender defining. They are not at the center of political of the political discourse about the role and rights and obligations of women. They have never been shrouded in taboo. They have never been utilized for the purpose of controlling one half of society. And um, if you need a confirmation, the Russian state does not persecute people if they draw a pancreas on social media, but nobody does it anyway because it's not provocative. Um, but the state is much less tolerant of vaginas as the Svitkova affair shows. And um, in her poem, actually, the rule makes a point of stress stressing that her own freedom of expression is conditional upon living outside Russia. She was born in Omsk, she studied in Moscow, but she now lives in Lviv in Western Ukraine. Also, the harmony that should not be disturbed is hypocritical, I think, because literature develops by pushing boundaries, formal boundaries, semantic boundaries. And we can assume that Kinjev, who has won many prizes as a poet himself, um, has done so himself. So those who adopt the stance of um, basically telling them off for disregarding allegedly unmovable literary standards, um, I have the impression they're just hiding their own unease about a young woman challenging boundaries. So they use this indignation about the topic, about the words, about the formal tropes to hide an indignation about boundaries being pushed. So actually they seem outraged at the very existence of a literary universe that is different from their own but impossible to overlook. Now this is another one and um, this is, I don't know who she is, Victoria Shochina, so this is a blog post of Zen Yandex um, under the, um, so the, the blog is called Ruskaya Zizm and I think this gives you an idea of what this is about. Um, so she, um, she doesn't like the fact that um, Limbo wrote this poem and she says, well, who of Vaskorgia, прежде всего феминистки и Дмитрий Кузьмин, and so she has her enemies identified um, and um, then says, ведь если за равенство, то зачем вы Италии акцентировать? So if you are, um, if you are advocating equality, why are you making a point of you being a woman? Um, so, стремление утвердить свой гендер. This is actually another of Rimbu's pet hates. Um, she says that women who don't, um, who, for example, don't use feminatives, don't use feminine forms of um, nouns, um, are accepting the masculine as a, um, as a standard. So by not highlighting the fact that you are female, you are actually subscribing to the norm and make no mistake, the norm is not neutral, the norm is masculine. So um, this person traps, falls into that trap. 
Дело не в теме, для ФАИЗ нет запретных тем. Дело в том, как эта тема решается. В ДНСС поэзии как таковой нет, есть нечто подражающее русским переводом с американского. So here you have the other enemy. This is not poetry, it sounds like Russian, a Russian translation from the Americans, not from the English. С английского языка, но американского. Um, so this person then writes a long, nasty parody. Um, I'm just giving you a lot, tiny little bit of it. And the um, part that I have highlighted, the, the parody is as long as the public. Um, and the bit that I've highlighted in yellow. Всяко градуга на флаге над посольством США в Москве. Там, где правит диктатор Путин. И кровавые руки ебни тянутся к чьим-то вагинам. Потом Галина все это записывает в столбик и называет стихами, не которые верят. So here is the traditional, um, the traditional enemy of a certain patriotically, patriotically minded um, stratum of society. So you have the rainbow flag, flag and the, um, uh, um, the US embassy in Moscow. So LGBT as a Western ideology, so this gets um, um, this gets incriminated <laughs> to be dimble. And then of course the inevitable accusation that you can't write free verse. So you can't just put in a column and call it poetry. So actually interesting, interesting um, discussion, the discussion with Ella um, before this talk, um, where the same problem um, the same problem was talked about. So um, perhaps slightly quickly, um, Rimbo on 3rd July, so the same day, um, she responded to the torrent of negativity by posting a new poem called Vivica Ruska Literatura, just as long as Maya Vagina, and perhaps more interesting, also a lot more forceful. Um, those who've read the Commons on Facebook, both on Olimbo's own page and on um, Kenjiev's um, thread, we'll see that she has repurposed some of the negative comments to um, give her poem a note, a, a more uh, sharper and more modern note. So um, this poem is interesting to look at from the point of view of personal pronouns, how Rimbo very, very cleverly um, changes from ya yeah, from first person singular to first person plural and the kind of thing that she is um creating so unlike um the uh, my, my vagina is almost entirely written in first person singular this is using the first person plural a lot and you can already see that in the first quote so the, the poem starts with a series of rhetorical questions for her attacker um, so her list, um, her list includes, it includes the body as the aspect by which women are often defined. So, кто имеет право и голос, чтобы издеваться в своих текстах над нашими словами и телом, мыслями и текстами. Um, her focus is very much on chauvinistic criticism of women's words, so we can assume on the criticism of women's poetry. So conceptualizing herself as the representative of an invisible collective is a clever move for somebody who is under attack from a crowd, especially if it's a powerful crowd. So Rimbo's we here seems inclusive, so she's writing from within and on behalf of the collective of women writers. At the same time, one purpose of this stance is to delineate identity and ultimately to draw battle lines. So WE stands for female writers who suffer censure at the hand of the male establishment and who struggle against these power structures. So the WE is actually the WE of feminist poets and the opponent is the male dominated literary establishment, which emerges in this poem as a hostile and closed group with the temerity to impose norms on women and the text and rights. So um, 
she isn't making that shift from individual to collective explicit. Like, for example, Ahmadova in her Requiem, this um, quintessential text where she, the poet, starts speaking for um, other women. Lavu and the poet says. Zimbul doesn't do this. So she seamlessly moves from singular to plural and back again. And um, so this narrator um, introduces a, um, um, a slightly, this narrator introduces distance from that ideological standpoint of the we narrator, the personal narrator. Um, but it lacks any, so if you're looking for tenderness in this one, you won't find any. So her encounters with those who impose poetics in the name of received standards are all marked by violence, whether physical or verbal or virtual. So we visit and we, we, we actually witness several attacks in this um, poem, um, both a, a physical attack on her and um, a description of the online abuse that she is that she is actually um, facing. So this is um, the Velika Ruska Literatura is an indictment of male-centered Russian literature. And so in that sense, Velika Ruska Literatura um, is part of a system per perpetuating violent repression. And according to Rimbu, this system works because it is implicit. So um, she is the, the, the system of, um, of um, patriarchal norms is implicit. And this is, again, why she's saying you have to be clear that you're a woman and not use masculine forms. So um, she um, she criticizes that the system is not acknowledged as an order created for the benefit of a particular group. So because exposing the patriarchy as a man-made, forgive me, the pun, um, system would expose it as replaceable. If it was created, then it can be uncreated and then it can be, it can be redone. So this is um, this is what she is talking about. Who is possible to share and write the poem? Объяснить, как работает эта система и что она для вас значит. Будь смелым. Покажи нам свое природное право. So in that, so we understand that class, uh, uh, classical Russian, велика русская литература applies not just to well-known texts, but um, designates the entire established contemporary literary scene. Ends on a, the poem ends on a note of hope. So, um, so here in this, um, in this um, um, quotation, she hopes for um, these repressive men to be made invisible. Um, Хоть бы вам такую одежду, которая делала вас невидимыми для нас. First part of law. Для женщин, девушек, дочерей. И для мужчин, отказывающих вписываться в матрицу гегемонной маскулинности, критикующих патриархат, не играющих по их его правилам. Для кверных людей, идущих за руку по улице. Для небинарных персон с цветными волосами, идущих по улице с улыбкой вам навстречу. So here, Rimbu's collective is all of a sudden expanded massively, and um, only one group is left out of this reassuring space of we, namely those men who have for centuries imposed their retrograde standards on Russian literature. So the um, future of Russian literature is not the greatness, Velika, that in Russian carries notions of national exceptionalism, but openness. Nasha Raznaya. So this is the most important thing. So the effect of Rimbu's juggling of pronouns, plural, singular, and back, is that those excluded 
from the future of Russian literature. Это литература будущего, моя вагина, литература вся моя вагина, и тебе тут не место, um, тебе пизда. Um, those who are excluded from this future are those, those men to whom the poet addressed her rhetorical questions at the start. So the poem is very neatly, in that sense, closed, closed circle. Um, so the future is a literature in which women have a full voice. And I mean, tibia pizda, tibia pizdiets, um, this is the end of you. Um, so she is defending this idea of um, female writing against the vulgarity usually associated with um, words for genitals. So to wrap up a bit and to open some open it up to some questions. So like the Svitkova, I at Svitkova affair, um my vagina and its impact originated in social media and were carried along by social media. Social media offers enormous opportunities for poets, especially in a society with a fairly closed literary um literary market such as Russia. So um, you don't need to find favor with an editor to publish. At the same time, editors are not reluctant to publish something that was on Facebook. So social media can make a poem go viral. And social media can also um, basically be a prelude to print, can um, attract the attention of people who might put it to print. And it's interesting, um, so, but of course, to, in order to be noticed and in order to, um, these are just the translations that, um, that get, really happen um, instantly. So Kevin's first um, translation into English was there the next day. Um, but in, in order to be noticed, you need um, to, um, have a reputation already as a um, as a poet um, in order to gain a reputation as a poet facebook is not enough and you need institutional support it also helps if you're not alone and whose support is better than that of um, dmitry kuzmin the veteran publisher and tireless curator of literary projects who has an ear for talent and also an ear for good trend and so what i have given you here is just an idea is just a, an image that shows you how well networked this scene is so sigma um, um actually it's not a sigma it's f piece more on sigma um which is a, a platform for text and also a seminar where galina Rimbu is one of the editors and facilitators together with other women whose names you will see here are um, actually repeated. Um, all of the prominent feminist poets at the moment have published in the Wars Buch, um, which is an online and print journal um, done by Kuzmin, and have had their collections. These were often Vasyakina Rimbu, Yusufova, and Sirenka. They all have other collections out as well. So very often, Argo Risk was actually a first collection, a first full book. And then um, um, F letter came out in October, like uh, the end of October, or early November. And the poets in, um, published include Rimboso here, we have the feminists again. And Maya Vagina is in there in a translation by Kevin Platt that is much revised from the Facebook one. But of course, Galina is also one of the editors of this, of this um, anthology. So, um, in a sense, it comes a bit full circle. This is a resource you, resource you might want to explore um, because it is not done by any of the people from this circle, but as you can see on the left, and the reason I'm giving a screenshot rather than going is that it's hard to screen share and then change screen. Um, you can see that, um, the author has actually put the same people is talking about the same people so she is talking about Vasyakina, and she also has a um, she has a definition of and um, she has a um, she has 
under the um, entry for Rumbo, um, a description of the scandal around Maya Vagina. Um, so this is um, actually a very useful starting point for anybody interested in film Bayesia. Yeah. Um, so the the um, the fusion of literary aesthetics with the political agenda has clearly become a strategy in the struggle of activists um, for the hearts of their audience for the feminist cause, because art engages people up, gets people talking, and a lot of young women um, are fascinating, are fascinating with this stuff. So, and I'll stop um, with a number of questions. These are questions I am um, exploring in my research, and they are not at all limited to um, Rimbo. So Rimbo was just a, um, a case study. But, so this case really sh sh throws into sharp relief a number of interesting questions that include genre. So does work that thrives on the internet have to fulfill certain formal criteria? And are they different from work that thrives on different channels? And um, so unlike the Insta poetry we saw before, this is not short poetry, and that it is not accompanied by any fancy stuff such as pictures or videos or soundtracks or anything. Um, but it is very accessible and it is very topical. Um, so then there is um, textual authority because it is easy for the author and for others to modify or even remove a text that's circulating online. And I had this um, discussion with Kevin Flatt, the translator, who said to me, um, if you want to use my translation, use the last one for F letter because the Facebook one was just a draft. And two of the ones in the, in, in the middle are kind of, I'm getting there. So the translation has um, morphed into something else. And then um, there is the question of what is literary success or what is perhaps, um, what is that criterion for being included in the canon if we can define what the canon is. So do viral spread and frantic discussion in the comments section of a Facebook thread count as a measure of success? And are there different categories of success for different kinds of poems? And what happens if you remove these poems from their context? So would we be debating Maya Vagina if it hadn't been the literary scandal of summer 2020? And so I will stop with that. And um, thank you very much for listening to me. And I will now try to stop. I don't want to share my screen anymore. Okay. So um, this was thank it. Thank you very much, Josie, for your wonderful presentation of this um, very topical um, activist poetry. Now, there are the first questions. Um, we can open up the discussion quite now. I have a question too, but I can ask it later. David, I uh, would like to start, please. Uh, are you sure, Henrika? You can go first. Mm -hmm. That's okay. And I can answer in German or Russian. I am not. Um, okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Josie, uh, so much for this introduction to this text and this kind of extended. Uh, uh, event. Um, um, uh, I, I'm going to kind of lead lead to a question that's actually kind of specific, um, which is that you know up to this point, um, let's say over like the last 20 years, um, r all Russian poetry in general has been pretty experimental um, and uh, pretty innovative. But I think one of the sort of uh, or one of the sort of taboo subjects of it has been a really marked gender divide um, between how the men write and how the women write, especially sort of the, you know, let's, uh, we could say cis heterosexual men uh, and, and the women. Um, I, you know, when I read um, someone like Skidan or uh, Medvedev or whomever, um, I, it's often I imagine them almost sort of trying to take Orphic Viagra, you know, just to restore power <laughs> to poetic discourse. 
Um, and, and then when I think of the female strategies, and this is another part of this taboo subject, is that the women have been much more innovative and successful, at least in my opinion. Um, and uh, you know, you, if you look at some of the sort of female strategies, like Glazova, Nika Skandiaka, Rimbu, um, a lot of them tend to be less about sort of force and power in discourse and more about uh, grammatical strategies, actually, I would say, if I were going to be purely a formalist about this, things like polyvalent codes, bilingualism, um, uh, sort of polyvalent meanings, etymological metaphor. What's interesting to me then about this text is that, you know, when I've read, and I'm not super familiar with her, although I, I find her fascinating and I really like her, um, when I've read earlier poetry by Rimbu, it falls in line more with me with like a kind of Glazova kind of text where it's more gnomic, more hermetic, more grammatically oriented. Um, there's not a lot of discursiveness to it. Um, whereas this actually reads like Kirill Medvedev. I mean, complete with, complete with the, ca the all capitalization of, and sort of the polemicized rejoinders that, that it kind of uh, connotes or denotes. Um, so I, I find that transformation in Rimbu really fascinating. Um, it seems like it's been much more successful for her than it was for Medvedev. Um, and I, uh, uh, who, by the way, does sound like an American, and it's because he read a lot of Charles Bukowski, among others. But, you know, um, so, there, you know, there is some sense to that sort of like naming the enemy, like, at the Samaritanskova Previdimo, you know, like, it does sound American in that sense. And, and there are like literary historical reasons for that. But, um, but anyway, um, if you could, uh, if you could broach that, I would really appreciate it. And I just, Specifically, the transformation in Rimbu is this like because I don't know I'm I'm not on social media, which is a terrible idea for someone interested in contemporary poetry, but I just hate it. So, um, so but yeah. Anyway, thanks. Yes, I wish I had your courage uh, to get off social media because I got it for work, and then of course, well, um, I went down a rabbit hole. Um, but um, yes. Um, First things first, I mean, just about the, just um, why I said calling it a translated from the American is an insult in this sense, is because it had nothing to do with, this is because he has read a lot of American poets, but this is something foreign, this is something un-Russian, therefore it's not poetry. I think this is why I, um, why I um, phrased it and framed it in that way. Um, I think, um, Rimbaud's evolution has to do with the evolution of feminism as activism and um, feminism as this kind of feminism, which is, they aren't the first feminists, um, but which is um, very closely, well, first of all, feminism, feminists are possibly the only um, live, living, um, protest movement left after the clean out following um, 2011, Balogna, Diawa, and so on. So that's one thing. Um, and of course, the, 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 the things that they get involved in, these FPSMOR and the um, um, seminars on, 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 on the FPSMOR and so on, um, there is a lot of current events that are actually um, reflected there and the um so the sisters Khachatulian, um the decriminalization of domestic violence and so on and so on the incursion of the russian um, orthodox church and its um, um its vociferous opposition to abortion to sex education and everything else um, the hunt for lgbt which has led to some feminists uh, not wanting to be associated with LGBT um, because it says, well, at the moment the LGBT come, we will be persecuted and we don't want that. So, you know, divide and rule. So I think the, this, this is really reflected in the, um, in, the, in, in the poetry and I think you can see that. And if you look at the FP small, then you will find that they all, I mean, Lida Yusupova, in a sense, she is the mother of that current, although she was born in the 60s, um, because she is the first person who wrote a really graphic, completely unmistakable poem about being raped. Um, so, so, so I think that is one, and the men, if I may say, um, they just don't have any topics to get 
they don't, sorry, <laughs> it's so normal. Um, no, but I mean, the, 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 the topics that the men can, you know, they look at Skidan um, and the translate circle. I'd rather not. <laughs> you are on recording. <laughs> Um, if you look at them, um, you, it's all about poetry. Like, what is poetry? What is poetry? What is poetry? And because this question has been um, has been done for so long, you have to do something new, and therefore you have to so you have to add layer upon layer upon layer, and then you end up with this poetry that is actually very very hard to access if you are not into this kind of aesthetic. I think the men too tend to fixate on the mythos of the poet. Yes, which, which yes. feeds the frame of the work and, and is much more, takes on a very dead half-life of its own in them. Um, whereas, the, yeah, women. Yeah. And I mean, you will find women like Glazova, who is, um, you know, she is involved with the um, and, and so on. Um, but she is not in what she's writing. She is not actually um, in a group or in a circle. And I think being in a circle, in a, being a group, you know, Vasyak and Vasyrenko and Rimbul, they actually studied together. Being in a group like that, they're doing Evkismod together. Um, they're actually reinforcing each other. Yeah. They sometimes sound quite similar. So maybe that is, is one way of looking at it. Okay. And of course, the myth of the poet um, is very, very refined. So, you know, it becomes something very ethereal and very ivory tower, whereas fuck all this is a lot easier and a lot more accessible. And I mean, um, Ella um, Mingazova has told us how um, accessibility attracts readers. And this is true to some degree. It, I mean, it, this is not an argument that sort of don't write complicated poetry, but I think it, um, it contributes to their success. Thank you so much. Really love this. Yeah. Are there some, any further questions? Matthias? Yeah. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for your uh, inspiring and provocative talk. Um, and I do have a very simple grassroots question. I don't know very much about Russia and I barely speak any Russian, but I've been there for about a dozen times as a school teacher. And I know that uh, in the education system, there are many women. I think it's about 90% women, 10% mm. um, men. Um, and I, I believe there would be a great um, this is probably a crude term, revolutionary uh, potential. But why doesn't the spark uh, going out from poetry, why doesn't that spark ignite the potential? Um, you know, I like working empirically, i.e. Um, making, well, creating, coming up with a theory on the basis of something that I have studied. Quite concretely, so I can't say, but I mean, what we all know in in all systems, no matter what the system looks like, people who live in the system consider it normal, and they don't necessarily see any need for change unless they are themselves somehow squeezed in or. Um, social norms, societal norms change. So the moment societal norms start changing, you will find people jumping on the train that is already going. But to get it going takes a lot of effort. Um, of course, the education system, I mean, people are People are not that free. I mean, one thing is definitely that um, if you are, for example, active on social media, if Rimbo was living in Russia and she was a teacher, she'd be sacked. So this is totally impossible. As this, this display of your personal life, um, uh, sexual, sexually explicit material, um, 
the um, homosexuality as a topic, even the description of homosexual sex, that whole lot, none of them would have a chance of um, being, so nobody would touch them with a barge pole in that sense. So I think all these, um, and, and so you have a system in which you have a lot of people who are socialized very differently. And of course, the problem with an aggressive discourse, and this is an aggressive discourse, the more aggressive your discourse, the more potentially um, norm shattering it is, but also the more off-putting it is for a lot of people. So I can imagine that, you know, you have to move your head in a particular direction. So, you know, and there are things that Brimbo was saying in that preface to F letter that I would put a big question mark against. So, because it is so, so radical. So the more radical you are, the less likely you are to find a mass following in that sense. Your, those who support you, those who defend you, they will do so all the more, um, all the more fervently, but your mass appeal is seriously compromised. You know, if you give that poem to my mother, who has nothing to do with Russia, and um, you know, she will take the she will take it's now translated from German, so she will take the, 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 the page and slap me on the head with it. I can tell you that. So I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you. There's a reason she's not invited. <laughs> More questions? I would like to ask you, Josie, uh, is there any echo on this discourse now in Russia or in the Ukraine or in other countries and on which platforms? This only in the online media or social media or are there also some echoes in um, journals and so on? Um, I mean, if you... <sighs> I mean the, the the poems I haven't I haven't systematically looked for feminism in in the um, in um, like now at this moment in print journals. But um, for example, Wozduch is a mixed publication, so both print and online. Vasyakina um, and so on. They all have paper collections out, including their next collections with other, um, with other publishers. So there are evidently people who are not afraid of this discourse and who, think, who also think it's interesting from a literary point of view. Because I think when we're looking at this stuff um, as literary scholars, um, you know, I'm not a gender studies specialist and I'm not a sociologist. Um, so I wouldn't have, um, I wouldn't have written about it if I didn't find it interesting from a literary point of view. And um, some people may be simplistic, but Mbou is no, she's no beginner. She's young, but she's no beginner. And, um, you know, if you, if you the, the way in which Maya Vagina, it really covers any possible ground that you could see she covers, um, you know, motherhood, heterosexual married sex, um, taboos, homosexual sex, um, she, has, she has it all. Ma ma um, masturbation, how do you discover yourself? So, and she does, she, 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 you know, you don't even notice because it's very simple to read. You don't even notice and it's like, oh, and she puts Svetkova in there and this and this and this and this. And I mean, I remember um, I submitted my first draft of this and um, Henrika said to me, well, um, would you mind making this a bit more academic and look into some of the um, formal features? And I thought actually the one thing that I find really interesting, Vidika Ruska Literatura, which to me is the more interesting of the two texts, um, although they're much, much more polemical. Um, the, the, the way in which the, the, the lyric persona and the author and then the we, and you know, we read we and we think it's always the same, but it isn't, it, it morphs, it morphs from 
feminist poets and from girls who are being hassled and not taken seriously. And all of a sudden, it's all, it's the entire world safe for those few patriarchal bastards. And we have even managed to get all the men who criticize the patriarchy onto our side. So she never advocates. You know, if you, the one thing you can't say about the is that she hates men. She doesn't. Um, so it's not, she's not advocating a, 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 a space for women only. Um, so in a sense, she is also the poster girl of this because you can't, in a sense, accuse her um, of, of, of being, you know, oh, she is feminist and lesbian and radical. And you can't do that. You know, she's a married mother. <laughs> um, so that, that, that works. Um, but um, so 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 literary. I mean, um, um, pay, traditional print publishers are, put, are printing this stuff. And if you want the controversy, if you want the um, discussion about this, I think you have to stay online. Um, already, because yeah. So I, yeah. If you want the controversy, um, and I found there are lots of blog posts and pages that actually have controversial articles that are, you know, some of them are very odious and some of them are less so. Um, you can find a lot on there. Yeah, thank you. Who would like to ask another question? No more questions. Everybody wants to go home. Look, this has been a long day. I have one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would be interested, well, and I think that it could be a nice way to round this off, to talk about the kind of challenges you faced and decisions that you made when you were translating this poem. Because for all it looks simple, these are the most challenging texts to, to render, aren't they? This is a good one. I actually haven't translated it, but this is one for an interview with Kevin Plass, actually, who brought it up. Um, um, as, and I remember when he put his first translation on Facebook, some people um, criticizing certain word choices that he had made. Mm. Um, and for example, Velika Ruska Literatura, I think one thing that would throw me as a translator is what do I do with Velika? Do I translate it as great? Do I translate as grand? But then Velika Ruskaya, I immediately put this in a I immediately put this into a particular corner and I can hear the irony. How do I how do I communicate this to my readers? So and Veliki is actually, you know, it's an everyday word, every student knows that after the first month. So yes. And I think actually, I mean, Umbu is less um, is less of a um, problem creator in that sense. Mm. But a colleague of mine has translated a, a play called Sisters um, by Olga Yuzhova, and this is about Rat Fiam, so radical feminist, a feminist. Uh, Quite radically feminist group that doesn't um, recognize trans women as women. And um, so the playwright spent a year on chat boards and um, kept her sanity, which is a miserable thing. And um, so Fiona had submitted this and um, she had a ridiculous peer review from the translation. Um, but that is where you, because there is so much jargon, ah, um, there is so much jargon in there um, that is specific to these publics and to these groups. And the groups have no equivalent in, in Western. So, for example, Rad Fiam, anybody who knows anything about Russian feminists knows who I'm talking about. Radical feminists? Yeah, radical feminists. You know, it's two separate words. So, I think this is this almost, uh, first of all, the translator needs to research their. So this is not because it's simple words, it's simple. You need to research the, um, the context. Um, and, and yes, and I, I, I think they, even something as simple as that makes up for translation logs. 
Mm. Quite significantly. Quite significantly, yeah? And I mean, even the term pizda, sivya pizda, you can't translate that, you know, and the joke is like, how do you do that? We don't have an equivalent. We, we might. Have you heard, a, or well, it's not, but it's a visual equivalent. This whole thing reminded me of Carol Lee Schliemann's interior scroll. Do you know what I'm talking about? Carol no. Lee Oh, she also did this series of, 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 of like performances called Meat Joy when she had naked people surrounded by meat, but she did this at the Tate in 1975. Um, she pulled a, a, a rolled up piece of paper with a conversation that she wrote between Cezanne and herself and she right. pulled it out of her vagina and read it in front of everyone um, and it was great I mean I, I think it's one of it's probably one of the most significant feminist uh, sort of events of that of that right event. okay yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you were waving the hate of poetry um, in front of the camera. Wait. Oh, I was I was waving it for Ella. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you guys get get chatting. Um, could, I, could I could I ask you one more thing though, Josie? Oh, sure. So you were you were sort of and you were getting to this when you were talking about just now when you were talking about sort of the pluralism actually of Rimbo, um politically and also I think stylistically and I, that's what interests me is that. The formalism mirrors the politics to me and this evolution that she takes from a sort of more Glazova-esque style to here we have, I mean, this is very much like Medvedev, who to me is like one yes. of the sort of quintessentially, quintessential male narcissism as a, <laughs> as a poetic political platform, you know, and yes. um, I, I find it fascinating that she's able to accommodate both of those things and I, I, I um, not only fascinating, but healthy and very welcome because I, I think there had been uh, I think there had been more of a sort of uh, divide between gendered strategies before this. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, if you read Pavel Arseniev, Pavel Arseniev, you find a similarly kind of simple and quite um, accessible language. Sure. Um, I think what the women probably don't have. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I sound as sound if I'm bashing the, the, the men here, which I am not. Um, I I think that the, the, the guys, especially those guys, and especially that, you know, Medvedev, Ivan, and so on, they have enormous confidence in themselves as being literary significant in literature. And as we all know, if you have confidence, then people will um, take your word, uh, you know, more, more likely to take you seriously if you come across as very confident. I think Rimbu has the same sense of herself, and I actually appreciate it. She does, but she she didn't start with it. Okay. I think she I think she arrived at that. Well, good for that her. One. And <laughs> I don't know, that's I good. She arrived at it, and, and and you know I noticed this. I am not a political activist, but I noticed this in my own political statements that I make and that I feel forced to make um, over the maybe the last three years, or maybe since the Brexit vote. Um, that I have become a lot more, um, a lot less nuanced and a lot more, um, you have an attention span of five seconds and during these five seconds, I'm going to get this thing across to you. There you go. So um, this is, uh, you know, uh, this, this, is, this is maybe a social media thing. Um, maybe this is a, um, so, so, you know, maybe, maybe it's a sign of the time, maybe it's social, social media. Um, but I think this is, you can notice this in a lot of, in a lot of people. Um, and a lot of, you know, when you, when you are faced with, uh, I don't know, um, people who say all abortion is murder and you should go to prison for it, um, you all of a sudden have to be pro-choice, even though you might not like the rhetoric of the pro-choice people. You know, that is, that is an, a personal example I can, I, can, I can give you. I don't like the rhetoric of the pro-choice people, but in the face of the debate that is going on at the moment, I have no choice but throw, to throw my weight behind them. Mm -hmm. So... When things become existential and embodied, in other words, yeah. Yeah, and when things become, and they become more simpler, they become simpler. Oh yeah. 
They become simpler. And it's actually a shame. You know, um, we lose complexity and we lose the patience for complex arguments. And somebody, you know, somebody starts saying, well, you know, um, I don't know, um, uh, let's take a provocative example. Well, the Nazis did some good things. You can't even check, finish that sentence before half of the room being at your throat and saying, you know, you um, excuse Nazism, you excuse Hitler. It's like, did I? Did I? You know, you're a racist, you're an anti-Semite, am I? Did I say anything? So, so the, 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 the willingness to listen to a complex and slightly uncomfortable train of thought has really decreased. So if, what, what can you do in people's face? It's a shame. I, I, want, I wonder though, um, I, I do, I agree that uh, social media has condensed this, particularly this ridiculous 140 character Twitter. On the other hand, when I was studying theology, um, a writer like, for example, Origen of Alexandria, who subsequently anathematized, used the rhetorical strategy, he would recapitulate the argument of his opponent and then dismantle it. Then subsequently, when you have people like St. Jerome, who wanted to, um, who wanted to denigrate Origen, they then selected the bit where he quoted the opposite and said, Origen of Alexandria said this. So, in a sense, this is also, I think, that as David says, when it's existential, when it's about something that for people is life and death, or even beyond life and death as it is with theology, this uh, dualism comes in, and it's something that is familiar in the first century, and it's familiar now, and perhaps reflects as much on the battleground situation, the intensity and the importance um, it's just that now we have this, it used to be that this was a discussion between a small circle of people who, who had the information and had the tools to have the discussion, and now it's for everyone, it's global. And uh, yeah. perhaps it's a matter of scale, as much as anything. Yes, and it is also a matter of we all and social media helps with that, I think, because we all live in a filter bubble. Mm -hmm. So if I am friends with lots of feminists, um, I get now lots of stuff um, relating to feminism on my Facebook feed. Um, if I start researching <laughs> neo-Nazis, I'll be inundated with content. Um, if I start researching um, Norwegians and something else, um, I will be in. So, so in a sense, we are encouraged by these mechanisms to pick the bits that we like, I think, is also one thing. But with Rimbo, I mean, you have, you know, if I see this on my Facebook feed, I only see the first five lines. She has to hook me with this. Um, because otherwise, I keep scrolling. Maybe Vasyakina has written something better. Or, you know, maybe somebody who has nothing to do with these um, people, so. Well, and, I, and, I, and honestly, I mean, not to, uh, to, to bring things back to poetry, and even though it, it will mean sort of bashing the men again, um, I think that, um, I think that uh, you know, this embodied existential threat is exactly what those men so really, really want and need. I mean, Medvedev writes that way, Skidan writes that way. Skidan writes about the dismembered poet figuratively instead of because he, he doesn't face that kind of resistance. And Medvedev is the same way. I actually wrote a small article on Medvedev and Parhesia, which is this Foucault's idea of embodied truth telling in which you can only do it in front of a tyrant only when you're about to be executed, like only when you're at ex existential risk. But you know, Medvedev doesn't have a, vagina, a vagina that can get him in trouble that way. So it's it's very different, you know. Um, thank you. This is thank you. This is the thought that was kind of stuck there, but didn't have a chance of coming out in any way because I was conscious of it. Yes. Yeah. So actually, the women, of course. Um, Nobody will ever write death threats to Skidan um, right. for um, writing something um, on the, the, the poet. And the, um, the, I think part of why they are so, they are supercharged at the moment, this group of feminists, is because they are getting that kind of, um, and I mean, when I say Rimbu got a lot of 
hassle and hate speech, she also got so much support. Um, and she, when she dragged the Kajir discussion, he had tagged her and she, she basically said, why are you, and he removed the tag. She, she said, why are you tagging me? If you want to speak to me, speak to me. But why are you tagging me when you're doing this? Um, and then she got involved in the discussion and then she, op she opened her own, her own thread on it and said, I'm bringing this back to my page because here I feel safe. Um, and so, so, so in a sense, you have this galvanizing um, enemy. So, you know, you have, it, it's actually great fun to be a mem member of a group and which is kind of clearly delineated because it has a common enemy. Great fun, I didn't mean it that way, but it is, it's definitely helpful um, if you have to define your, um, your identity, if you have to figure out where you are standing um, and what you like and what you are willing to, what you are willing to run a risk for or what you're not willing to run a risk for. This is, this is really, really, I think, um, important. So, yeah. Thank you. That was that was the I've actually written that down. Stolen from David Hawk. Thank you. Sophia? <laughs> yeah, just uh, just a short um, comment. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, speaking about the bubble in social media, so uh, it was interesting that how I got how, uh, how I um, um, I got acquainted uh, with this uh, poem for the first time. Uh, it's uh, where I read, uh, so like it was immediate reaction from uh, Ukrainian poets, which I follow, and uh, there were kind of uh, one, two, three, like I think three or four very good translations, and uh, I read them in Ukrainian, and then um, I was thinking, what's uh, <laughs> what's there and then okay so it's uh, Galina Rimbo <laughs> who wrote it and then I got back to her page and right. uh, we're reading uh, was reading all this uh, discussion and it was kind of also um, shit storm to uh, Bahit Kinjayev so a lot of people <laughs> like yeah probably it, it's also um, like black uh, PR is also a PR <laughs> for him so um yes um i mean i was astonished when i saw at his um somebody said to you i don't think to Rimbu, but to another woman who criticized him said on dobry boomer on each of the is nine a stuff to you both so you know he is a baby boomer um he's an old guy he doesn't understand any of it leave him alone he doesn't mean it like really he doesn't mean it i'm not sure um, you know, this kind of jovial little girl will stand over there, you don't know what you're doing. Um, and I think, yes, black PR is black PR. Actually, you just gave me a really, um, gave me another thought. Um, the, the Facebook, I mean, that was the bit that got viral, but you know, that got viral and that created this discussion. If you now Google it, you will find lots of hostile blog posts and articles. Um, but you will, because it was a while ago now, it wasn't you know, five months ago, six months ago. So you will now have to do a serious amount of digging to actually find the original and to find this discussion. So what you find now on the internet has nothing to do with what we found. Um, I actually first found Velika Ruska Literatura, somebody was saying something about it and then linked back to Valina's page and then I got onto that. Um, but, 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 but yes, I mean, yeah. And I think it does say something, I mean, I, I would need to ask her, but I'm quite sure that she disabled comments for people who are not friends with her after, for this reason. So you can only, if you follow her, you can only um, view, but you can't, you could like or dislike, but you can't follow. Yeah. And there are lots of comments that were from people who weren't friends with her. And I think this level of toxicity, you can only 
understand, you can only bear, you can only withstand if you have a similar level of support. And also if it hasn't happened, is this is not the first time that you're facing this. I think if I woke up to find this level of sheer personal nastiness on my Facebook wall, um, I'd hide and not come out again for a very long time and probably delete Facebook. Yeah, and she's struggling also, like she's not so emotional stable, so um, struggling with depressions and so on. So, mm. yeah. She did a good job. <laughs> she did. I don't think she had an idea what this would lead to. I mean, it completely eclipsed the original cause. You know, I got interested in the Tsvetkova affair. I had heard about it, but I was interested in it via this. You know, and then I found the reading marathon, and then I found the um, Fleet Sviet, um website with this media strike thing, which lists all the actions that were taken. But um, I hadn't bothered with it before. Yeah, Lila? Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a, well, there's kind of a paradox when I was listening to you, I thought there's kind of a paradox in the literary. Can you speak a bit louder? I'm very deaf, <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so there, is, there is kind of a paradox in the literary community where when people say literature is useless, um, it does not uh, bring anything to society or like, Sometimes you hear that kind of, it's not productive and stuff like that. And we as literary scholars, we say, well, no, literature is about life, is about the world, and we defend literature. Mm. But when literature is about something political, we get the reverse debate where people say, no, literature should be literary. And so my question to you, um, because it seems to me that you work a lot on political issues and in, uh, no, not at all. No, not at all, but I can try and uh, make an informed guess. So, so my question is, how do you deal with the question of literary value in relation to political um, uh, impact or how would you deal with that? If you um, yeah, I think this wholly depends on the poem. Um, because if you take something like, I don't know, the lyrical poems of Afanasifia that have, um, you know, they, they are beautiful and, 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 and moving, but they are not dealing, they are, first of all, they're 19th century, but they're also not particularly um, dealing with, with, with political, or you look at the symbolists and things like that. Um, you have to, I think you have to know, um, first, okay, first things first, I'm not one of those scholars who thinks that the text exists independent, independently of its author or of its context. I don't work that way. And so I, I won't hesitate to say what is actually the context of this. What was it, you know, if, if what is, so and Rimbo wrote this for a political action. So she wrote this for a solidarity reading where lots of people were writing stuff about reading and writing and displaying stuff about vaginas. So, which is why she wrote something on the vagina. You know, this was the, this was the, um, uh, the, 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 the technical brief, you know, bring something on vaginas. Somebody has been persecuted for vaginas. So, you can't, I cannot divorce the text from, from the brief. So, and it is also, we all know this, that this wouldn't have been so sensational if it hadn't been for the political context and for the debate it generated. So in a sense, you can't, um, you can't divorce these things. What I do is I, you can look for the literary means by which literature achieves, if, if literature has a political goal, by which it achieves it. 
Um, so, so you can you can you can you can analyze from I would analyze from that point of view. Um, and I mean, I don't think that literature should be divorced from from current events. That lit, you know, that writers should stay in their ivory tower and not meddle. I don't think so. So literature can be anything. But if somebody wants to stand in their to sit in their ivory tower, you know, if you look at the poet, for example, he's very old now in his eighties, uh, Mikhail Yeryomian. Um, and he has been since the 60s, been writing eight line poems. They're totally hermetic. Um, somebody has even translated them, um, although that's really, really hard. And they are all about language. So why should I, um, why should one be the right thing and the other thing be the wrong thing? So I only, I start, creating a problem if I measure them by the same yardstick. So if um, Rimbu had written on the vagina using the forms of Mikhail Yerionian, she wouldn't have got anywhere. That is pointless. So you know, she would have given a tiny little reading, nobody would have understood a word, and that would have been the end of it. <laughs> nobody would have written about it either. So in a sense, um, Poetry can be political or not. Um, so I, for, for, uh, for my, um, for my, um, uh, for my purposes, I don't need um, a delineation between them. And of course, you know, practical use. Well, you know, who knows what kind of practical use poetry has? But you know, poetry is not a spade. Why should we dig with the help of poetry? That's what we have spades for. Why should a poet be a doctor? That's what, that's what we have doctors for. So this is actually this is actually hierarchy, right? So political poetry is better or worse than purely literary poetry. Um, Non-biased poetry is better or worse. Confessional poetry is out or in. Um, don't write free verse or only write free verse. I'm not sure this is a satisfactory answer, but this is the only answer I have. No, th thank you. Because in, in a way then, um, Rumbu, she could be writing essays, but she writes poems. So. Yes, she also writes essays. I mean, look at the, um, uh, if you look at her Facebook page, you will find, hang on, I can even try doing it now. Um, you, she has a personal website where she says she will, um, but I really have to look what it, um, what it says, hang on, give me one second. And you know, this is the University of Tromsø, so even the computers are slow here. Um, where is she? So, um, so she has, no, she doesn't actually send to it. Um, this is, doesn't link to it anymore. So she has a link to a website where she's saying, well, I'm curating projects. I mean, this is what she does. She writes, she curates um, projects, including informational sessions about feminist activism, about which is um, sex education and stuff like that. So she's not just a poet. And if you read the, um, the introduction where I, that I quoted from only in Russian, in Russian only, um, from to F Letter, where she talks about her idea of the patriarchy. If that is not political journalism, I don't know what it is. Maybe we can add that uh, Rimbo could trigger or cause um, the scandal and draw attention to this, or exclusively because using form of poetry if you, she would have written it uh, in a form of a diary, for instance, or the f um, Facebook entry, nobody would like to discuss it. But it's the form of, po of the poem which triggered uh, the, the whole discussion because it is 
not convenient to read a poem about all this and so on. So the form of poetry, the political reason of this discussion, and this is um, nice to think about. And, yes. and, because, and because the patriarchy is so embedded in poetry and in literariness, which is what she sort of gets to eventually, I think, right? Yeah, and I think she thinks also about the patriarchy. Um, you know, this is this is further to the um, question about why do um, you know why does it not cause a bigger movement? It is ingrained and therefore it is not even seen. I mean, it took me a long time to understand to really understand the need for feminist literary criticism. If you think feminist means um, a female specific point of view because the other point of the point of view that we are used to the default is not neutral doesn't mean it is bad but the default is not neutral so you know when the when you think actually the default is not neutral then you start thinking so the patriarch the the, the, the hierarchy even if you don't like the word patriarchy the, the hierarchy is embedded very much so I think our time is out now. Yeah. We stop the discussion at this point. Okay. Cool. Thank you, people, for yes. Thank for you. Being such, a good, such a good audience. Amazing. Yes. And I do, have, I do have a case of imposter syndrome. I'm not a you know I'm not one of the prime researchers of of, of feminism. So you know I came at this um, researching internet poetry. So you know what does poetry what makes poetry go viral? Um, and you know how does this work and how um, you know what is the relationship between internet po uh, social media poetry and um, print you know, is print the my question Ella remains is print the gold standard is it that is that the case for everybody thank you and thank you Henrique for inviting me and thank you for encouraging me to write a, write about it Yes, and thank you very much for the amazing and informative talk, which encouraged our further research. And I would like to thank everyone for attending the lecture and for the discussion. We hope to see you soon at one of our next online presentations. Next week on Monday, Mikhail Desky from Moscow will speak about the new Russian drama. And on Wednesday, Yakov Margolis will speak on quantitative analysis of dictionaries and transit of Russian poetic language. Ooh, wow. Okay, I wish you a pleasant evening and goodbye everyone. Thank you and see you soon, I hope so.